Today, we are delighted to have R. Corey Bernhards, PhD, as our speaker and presenter. We will introduce him further in just a few moments. Please note that we are recording this webinar. The video webcast will be available for download from our website tomorrow. You will also be able to download the slide deck at the end of the presentation today, and it too will be available tomorrow at hdiac.org. And one final note, the chat function in the top right-hand corner of your screen is now enabled. Please feel free to type in any questions you have as we go along. We will collate those questions and answer them and any others we receive during a question and answer session at the end. Finally, I'll share with you a bit of background information about our center. We are a Department of Defense sponsored entity, one of three Information Analysis Centers, or IACs. Organizationally, we fall under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our mission is to be the go-to R&D, S&T, an rdt and &E leader within the Homeland Defense and Security community. We achieve this by providing timely and relevant information, superior technical solutions, and quality products to the DOD and HDS, COIs, and COPs. In doing so, we are able to help solve the most challenging technical problems facing government and military. We pursue this mission across eight focus areas. Alternative energy, biometrics, CBRN defense, critical infrastructure protection, cultural studies, homeland defense and security, our namesake, medical and weapons of mass destruction. Our external subject matter expert network is a critical tool on how we achieve this mission. Our presenter today is an HDIAC member SME, and our network is quite extensive we rely, we rely on them for uh, lots of help, actually. Sorry for that. So if you are interested in joining us as an HDI XME and have expertise in one of our focus areas, uh, please visit our website and apply. Or feel free to contact me directly. Uh, my contact information will be up on the screen at the end of the presentation. So compared to other types of weapons of mass destruction, biological agents pose a unique and uniquely unpredictable type of threat to the United States and her allies. The ability of a weaponized pathogen to replicate itself and spread throughout a population makes it potentially more lethal than even the most powerful explosive or powerful chemical weapon. As DOD's Joint Strategy for Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction states, it is essential for the Department of Defense to have as clear an understanding of the environment as possible with regards to a biological weapons threat. Central to achieving this mission, the strategy goes on to note, is the ability to promptly and accurately detect and identify a bioagent. As one leader in the DOD bioagent field has noted, if someone in the field is exposed to a biological threat, it could take a while to identify the pathogen through blood work, locate medicine, and administer it. We need something that will work faster than that. We've been capable of detecting, identifying, and characterizing pathogens and bioagents for decades. But the technology needed to do so has been largely confined to the laboratory. Truly mobile, Near laboratory quality detection systems were first developed by the U.S. Army in the 1990s when they deployed the Biological Integrated Detection System, or BIDS. BIDS was indeed a mobile system, but not really by much. It was roughly the size of a U-Haul truck pulling an additional U-Haul trailer behind it. Moreover, in order to function, the BID system actually required the continual supervision of two operators and its cost of operation exceeded about $1,000 a day. Since that time, the miniaturization of processing capacity has combined with other technical advances, namely in the field of microfluidics, to substantially advance our ability to detect and identify bioagents. Engineers across industry and government have already developed prototype devices that clock in at roughly the size of a spare battery pack for your smartphone. 
It seems only a matter of time before warfighters, as part of their standard issue kit, may carry a low weight and small size device capable of diagnosing a suite of biological threats anytime, anywhere in the field. Looking ahead, there is a distinct possibility that the list of biological agents dangerous to humans may expand dramatically. Just two days ago, actually on Tuesday morning, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine released a much anticipated report on biodefense in the age of synthetic biology. Sponsored and funded by DOD's Chemical and Biological Defense Program, the report notes that SynBio poses the threat of, quote, recreating known pathogenic viruses and making existing bacteria more dangerous. The report warns that the use of biotechnology to create a biological weapon would pose an additional challenge to the already tough task of agent monitoring. Even so, the recent development of next generation sequencing, which Dr. Bernhards will touch upon, may be capable of meeting the ever-present challenge of protecting the warfighter from any and all biological threats. Now to introduce our speaker. Dr. Corey Bernhards is a research microbiologist with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, or DITRA, which is the combat support agency charged with countering the risks of weapons of mass destruction. Dr. Bernhards conducts his research at the Edgewood Chemical Biological Center at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. His work focuses on the development of novel systems for detecting bacterial and viral biothreat agents, with an emphasis on advancing rapid sample preparation techniques and field deployable devices. Previously, Dr. Bernhards was a National Research Council postdoctoral fellow at the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases uh, after completing his doctorate at Virginia Tech. And with that, Corey, we will hand it off to you. Thanks, Joel. So before I get into um, bi biological detection, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the two agencies that I um, where I work. Um, as Joel mentioned, uh, DITRA, uh, their job is to um, eliminate, try to eliminate or reduce the threat of weapons of mass destruction, which can include chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and, and recently explosives were added to that list. So for the purposes of today's talk, we're dealing with biological threats and you have different types of biological threats. So you have your traditional agents that everyone is aware of, such as um, Bacillus anthracis, Yersinia pestis, for instance. You have your emerging diseases. So these can be um, brand new diseases that um, nobody has seen before, such as um, organisms that um, cause SARS or MERS-CoV. They also can be existing organisms that have expanded their, their uh, location um, or are now more problematic, such as Zika virus causing microcephaly. You also have the, um, as, as Joel mentioned, enhanced threats. So this would be synthetically modified organisms um, that can pose new threats or add new capabilities to um, existing threats. So, you probably know DITRA as a funding agency, particularly for chemical and biological defense, but we also have a division within the uh, CB department that conducts research. So it's a small division and um, it includes scientists from a variety of backgrounds that you can see listed on the top of the slide. Um, we are hosted in a variety of, of DOD agencies um, so we're based pretty much full time at these locations um, and we work on various projects, some of which you can see listed there. So where I work is Edgewood Chemical Biological Center or ECBC. So we're located at the southern portion of Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland and we focus on non-medical chemical and biological defense. So things like detection, decontamination, for instance. 
Um, we have a, a unique ability in that we have engineers at ECBC um, as well as the scientists. So we can go from fundamental research all the way up through um, device development and um, getting the hand, uh, getting these devices in the hands of the warfighter. So uh, ECBC has been around, it's been called uh, various things throughout its 100 year uh, history. And it was originally started um, during the advent of the uh, first chemical weapon use in World War One. So ECBC um, provides forensics um, support for detection of biological and chemical agents, elimination strategies. Um, for instance, we were responsible for eliminating the Syrian chemical weapons um, that uh, were given to the United States. So we developed a hydrolysis system um, out in the sea and disposed or eliminated those weapons. We also have been involved in detection of Ebola during the outbreak and developed ways to transport uh, personnel that were infected. So I work in the Biosciences Division at ECBC. We have a variety of capabilities, including a BSL-3 laboratory, where we work with bacteria, toxins, and viruses. We also have air sterilization capabilities, including in, in that BSL-3. Um, we evaluate commercial off-the-shelf devices as well as government-developed devices. Um, and we even have a, uh, the ability to uh, make large amounts of surrogate um, agents for field testing. So we have large fermenters that can, that can make these um, surrogate agents. We also have a sequencing facility. Um, we have um, a variety of instruments, including the Illumina instruments, and um, we're recently focused on Oxford Nanopore's Minion device. We also have a large proteomic core, um, a mini mass spec facility, and a variety of other uh, facilities. So today I'll be talking about biological detection. And I want to preface this by saying there's some semantic issues with detection versus identification. Um, detection technically refers to um, non-specific biological um, detection, and identification is specific. So I'll actually be talking about identification um, with the technologies that I'll be going over. So with recent advancements, um, in computational power, communications, and microfluidics, there have been um, large advancements in, in the development of biological detection. So obviously we know of the growing rate of computational power, the decreasing size of microchips, which enables um, devices to be smaller and more powerful. For communication, there are a lot of devices that incorporate smartphones and wireless technology. And microfluidics is a, is a big area where thousands of devices have been developed recently. Uh, most are for uh, point of care diagnostics. So at ECBC, we like to make sure that whatever detection technology we're developing is fieldable. So we take a look at size, weight, and power requirements for these devices. Um, we also take a look at sensitivity. So the concentration that you're able to detect a biological agent, whether it's one organism or 100, can make a big difference. And then specificity. So to be able to distinguish um, organisms from one another, say species of species, near neighbors um, is very important. So you can identify the threat and not a non-pathogenic um, near neighbor species. Also sample throughput is important. So the number of samples you can run at a certain time or the rate is, is also something to take a look at. So when dealing with detection or identification, 
you have to deal with a variety of matrices. And you can classify different matrices into two um, different divisions. So environmental or clinical. With environmental, you have a variety of uh, matrices, including anywhere from water, um, soil, uh, even plants and mosquitoes as vectors. Um, soil, for instance, is a very difficult matrix to, to work with, um, especially for PCR reactions. Uh, soil contains a lot of inhibitors, such as humic acid, um, that can inhibit amplification reactions. So each individual uh, matrix can pose unique challenges. With clinical, you have blood, urine, CSF, saliva, for instance. And these, again, pose different uh, challenges. So, like I said, you have environmental detection, and then you have diagnostics. Diagnostics requires a higher level of scrutiny when compared to environmental detection. Um, because you're dealing with diagnosing disease, you need to be highly accurate, um, and you have to go through FDA approval for your diagnostic. Um, for environmental detection, uh, we have a little more leeway um, to be able to develop these devices. And then you have two main types of detection technologies that I'll be discussing today. Uh, Antibody-based detection, so for instance, lateral flow amino assays, plate-based assays, microbeads, um, other types of biosensors. And then you have molecular detection, which is nucleic acid-based, so polymerase chain reaction, PCR, isothermal amplification, uh, genomic sequencing, for instance. So for antibody-based detection, the most basic type of assay currently used is the lateral flow amino assay. So everyone should be familiar with how this works. Um, this is how pregnancy tests work. So you have your sample that's put on an absorbent pad that wicks up the pad. You have antibodies that are labeled. If uh, your particular target is present in the sample, you'll see it show up on the test line. And then there's also a control line. So two lines means a positive result, one is negative. And you can see these um, strips. There's an example of a, one for listeria. Um, they're placed in different types of cassettes. And recently they've been multiplexed. So there's the IMAS device that you can test up to 10 agents at a time. Um, so this is a quick test. They only take 15 minutes typically. And uh, it's good for your initial presumptive tests. It's not confirmatory um, because they have high rates of false positive and false negatives. So you have to usually couple this with a, a second test to be confident with, with your result. Another type of antibody-based detection um, assays can be run on the Luminex uh, MagPix instrument, for instance. So this instrument is not necessarily that field deployable. It's more um, lab-based. Um, it does require substantial sample prep, but this instrument is nice because it is customizable and you can do a variety of different antibody-based detection assays and also DNA-based as well. Um, typically, they use uh, microbeads um, to bind, uh, that have antibodies bound to them for a variety of um, tests. So getting into molecular detection, um, first start with PCR. So I'm sure everyone knows about PCR, but it requires the use of two primers. Um, it cycles through different temperatures to amplify your DNA from a small amount to a large amount. So you can see an example of a real-time PCR instrument on the left um, from BioRad. And then on the right, it shows an example of an amplification curve that you see if uh, you have a positive result. Um, uh, the red line shows an example of that. So PCR has been um, incorporated into a variety of fieldable detection devices including the BioFire devices, the Razer EX and the Film Array. So the, uh, the Razer is an earlier version 
um, that was ruggedized and can test up to 10 different agents at a time. Um, and then one sample per run usually takes about 40 to 50 minutes for a run to complete and it gives you an amplification curve. Um, so they've developed some um, assays for biothread agents. For the film array, it's a little more advanced, but it requires the use of a laptop um, and a scanner device. Um, but it is a little better in that it does all the sample prep. Um, it's all automated and it includes bead beading so it can has ability to uh, break open spores. So um, that's the newer version from Biofire and um, the second version um, is in development. On the bottom you can see some some smaller devices such as the Epistem gene drive and then the Biomeme 2.3. So this is a handheld um, device that is um, that utilizes an iPhone and the 2.3 means that you have three different reaction tubes and you can test for two different targets um, in each tube. So you have six different tests that you can run for each run. They have a 3.9 version in development so you can test up to 27 different um, targets. So these devices are a little, well actually um, substantially more feelable than the BioFire devices. Um, so they're very lightweight and um, easy to use. So another type of DNA amplification is isothermal amplification. Uh, so this does not require thermocycling, so it works at a con constant temperature around 60 to 65 degrees, um, which really reduces the power requirements needed, which means your device can be smaller and more fieldable. So one example of isothermal detection is loop medi mediated isothermal amplification, or LAMP, which uses a set of six primers designed for your target. So you get the same type of amplification curves as PCR, one of which you can see on this slide. So one of the projects that I recently uh, worked on was trying to develop sample prep for, for a LAMP assay. Um, and we take a look at uh, different types of sample prep kits um, because sample prep is a big uh, bottleneck for detection, especially with all the different matrices that you encounter. So the Arcus kit was intriguing in that it was a simple two-step process and it only takes two minutes. So the kit consists of two reagents. We want to keep things simple for eventual use uh, by the warfighter because sometimes um, the soldiers have, have little experience with, um, you know, in the lab. So with this kit, no instrumentation is required. Reagents are stable um, at room temperature. And it doesn't actually extract DNA. It relaxes the DNA, as you can see in the bottom right, um, so that the polymerases can access the DNA um, more easily. So no, no extraction is required, which saves time and instrumentation. So I tried this with um, a biothread agent called Burkholderia pseudomallei, and we compared the Arcus prep to the uh, more established power soil prep. And so we spiked soil samples and um, compared the two using a, a lamp assay. And we saw very little difference between the two preps. And the power soil takes about an hour and a half, so this was a huge improvement. Um, power soil also requires a vortex, centrifuge, and refrigeration, um, which, none of which is needed for the Arcus prep. So we were happy with those results, and we were able to determine the limit of detection all the way down to 3.8 to 38 cells. Um, so the limit of detection was, was very good as well. And the last thing we tried was um, humus soil. So humus soil has close to 100% organic matter content, which is where humic acid comes from. 
which is a known um, amplification inhibitor for PCR. So with LAMP and for PCR, we saw no difference um, between the positive control with no soil and our humus soil that was spiked with pseudomallei. So the uh, Argus reagents are able to neutralize uh, humic acid and other inhibitors. So I, I would highly recommend the Argus kit. So the goal was to be able to utilize this sample prep into a lamp-based feelable device. So many of which are currently being developed. Um, you can see three here. At the top is one from the University of Pennsylvania. And it's a very simple device. They used a thermos cup at the bottom and then a 3D printed lid with a cell phone adapter. Um, and inside of the um, device is an area where the microfluidic chip resides. And then it works by the same mechanism that uh, ready-to-eat meal pouches are heated. Um, you just add water, heats up to 60 degrees, and your reaction takes place. And then the results can be monitored by the cell phone in real time and relayed for geographical monitoring. So on the, on the right side of that um, top picture, they multiplexed the microfluidic cassette for 16 different lamp reactors, so 16 different targets. And they also combined it with another type of uh, isothermal amplification for higher sensitivity. At the bottom left is the University of Illinois device, the path tracker. So same type of functions as UPenn's device, um, just a little different design. And then on the right is the NEMDX by Penn State, um, was developed for malaria detection. And it works with a, a disc that rotates and magnetic beads are used to move the sample through um, the microfluidic chambers. So there are countless of other devices in development, um, and we're just trying to, to find some that are good for use for the warfighter. So other types of detection, um, for instance, can be paper-based detection. We have at ECBC a synthetic biology group who is trying to utilize um, cell, cellular materials, so um, cells that are no, no longer living, they're lysed, just the components of the cells they embed them and preserve them on paper, and then you can transport them and rehydrate them on demand to be able to detect something. So you can make synthetically designed circuits and incorporate this into this technology. Um, this has a variety of applications for medicine, obviously, chem biodetection. Um, so this is an area of, of interest. You also have mass spectrometry. So in addition to chemical detection, you can also do biological with mass spec. You can look at peptides for, from proteins, including biological toxins. You can look at lipids or metabolites. And one um, interesting technique um, that was developed recently is called paper spray. So this is an ionization technique where you can use a paper ticket with your sample on it, such as a blood spot, and ionize it into the mass spec. And um, it's currently being developed for biodetection. It's been shown to work well for, for chemical. So another type of molecular detection is obviously next generation sequencing. So typically, you have instruments that are based in a laboratory. So at the top, you can see two examples of instruments from Illumina, the MySeq and the HiSeq. They have some newer versions as well. At the bottom are some instruments from PacBio. So you can see how large these instruments can be. You obviously cannot take these into the field with you. You have to bring the sample back. Um, there is a program at DITRA called the Sample to Sequence Program that provides a, 
um, optimized workflow for, for taking samples from the field back to labs and getting your result. Um, but it, it does take some time. So recently, the Minion portable nanopore sequencer was developed. So this device can fit in the palm of your hand. And you can see that it connects to a laptop. Um, so this is extremely fieldable. It's been used in West Africa during the Ebola outbreak. It's been used in Antarctica and even the International Space Station. So um, I'm trying to develop it for use um, for detection on the, on the battlefield. Um, there are a variety of sample preparation methods that I'm currently investigating, including the Voltrax device. So I failed to mention this, this uh, device is developed by Oxford Nanopore um, Technologies based in the UK. They're beta testing the Voltrax device, um, as well as the Zumbador that's in development, which does fully automated sample preparation. So um, the Voltrax can be used uh, with a computer program to move your samples back and forth on a membrane. You can heat the samples, um, mix them, incubate them uh, for library preparation, PCR, whatever you like. So we're currently testing those devices. I also like to test the Arcus kit that I mentioned earlier. And we recently incorporated this OmniLice device in the bottom right for sample preparation in the field. Um, this is a um, fieldable bead beater um, that is very tiny and operated by a small battery. So bead beating is uh, essential for breaking open spores. So you can use this in the field and be, be able to detect any type of biological agent, including hard to break open spores. Some other developments from Oxford Nanopore include the Gridion, which is a five plex version of the Minion, and also the Prometheon. And I believe that is up to 20 um, different uh, flow cell sequencers at the same time. On the bottom left is something that's pretty, um, I'm pretty excited about. It's called the Flongle. So the most expensive part of the Minion device is the flow cell, where the sequencing takes place. By, by using this Flongo device, you can keep the expensive part of the flow cell, the chip, reuse that, and insert a new cassette in. So this will dramatically reduce the price, and it, it's coming out, should be coming out this summer. Um, they also have something called the Smidge Ion, uh, which is a... Uh, you can attach to a smartphone, and it's even more miniature. Their ultimate goal is to be able to get this in the hands of anybody, um, including children, if you want to go around sequencing an insect, for instance. Um, you can smash it up, put it in your device, and, and know what it is. So that's their ultimate goal. So pretty, pretty neat technology coming from their company. And it, the company has interesting business model where they um, allow outside people to help beta test their products. So the advancements are, are extremely rapid. So for future outlook and uh, emerging issues, um, isothermal amplification devices are a hot topic right now for reasons I described earlier. You can definitely make them more fieldable. Um, UAVs are also very popular to be able to send a device attached to UAV in a plume, for instance, um, where you don't have to pose a risk to uh, the warfighter. Uh, portable sequencing, like I mentioned. Um, and, and one of the biggest issues with sequencing is the data analysis. So it can be very um, complicated. You need some, you know, a lot of education in order to be able to analyze a DNA sequence data. 
So at Ditro there is a program called Edge um, where they're um, incorporating a variety of data analysis software that is easy to use for users with little experience. Um, so that, that's a nice, really nice tool. And then a really hot topic um, currently is the ability to detect unknown and genetically modified organisms. Um, like Joel mentioned in the beginning, synthetic biology poses a big threat to um, you know, new uh, the ability to easily make new threats. So we need to be able to detect these new threats. So to conclude, uh, while PCR and isothermal amplification technologies will continue to be developed, um, fieldable genomic sequencing is clearly superior in that it can detect any agent, um, not just the ones that you developed your assays for. So, um, however, the targeted base approaches will still be relevant if you don't want to deal with all the background. So um, if you were just looking for something, you know what you're looking for, um, those can still be valuable. So um, rapid and accurate detection and, and identification is, is critical to national security, DOD objectives. Um, these emerging technologies allow for faster decision making, um, which is also more informed. And this obviously promotes warfighter protection and maintains mission readiness. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions from the audience. I see a bunch in the chat room that I haven't been able to address, but um, hopefully we can go through some of those now. Yes, Corey, thank you so much. Uh, you're right, we have a lot of engagement and a lot of questions. Uh, please feel free to answer those in, in any order that you want. And for the rest of our attendees, uh, keep typing them in as we go. All right, I'll, I'll try to start from the top here. So I see one from uh, Paul Callahan. Second test is required for the assays. Do you mean a second assay or a confirmatory lab test? So um, with in an LFI, lateral flow amino assay, for instance, you can go into the source location, do a quick test, so that's your presumptive test. Then you can take a sample and bring it back to a secondary location that is, is more um, secured where you can run a second uh, field confirmatory test. This could be a PCR-based test, sequencing-based. We're getting to the point now where we don't necessarily have to transfer it back to the United States for um, analysis. Um, but uh, for, for really full and complete analysis, that, that, is still, that is still necessary. But we can get field confirmation um, pretty close to the source. Uh, let's see here. Yes, and I, I apologize, I didn't, wasn't, don't have time to talk about every type of biological detection um, or uh, diagnostic tool. Um, I didn't mention anything about CRISPR. Obviously, that's a hot topic. Um, let's see. So Dan Regan, can you touch on some of the current issues that ECBC would like address regarding the paper-based detection systems? Yeah, so um, what you're finding with cell-free systems is that um, it's really hard to reproduce uh, your your um, conditions. There are a lot of components that go into these cell-free systems. Um, so this is a big issue, trying to standardize um, the methods that you need to make these detection assays. It, it's pretty difficult. It, it varies a lot from lab to lab. So that that's one issue that they're seeing. Um, Let's see, info on costs. So yeah, so these, these smaller fieldable devices can range in costs. Um, the Biomeme, for instance, the 2.3 version, 
The commercial version costs $8,000, um, which is on the high side for, for these devices. Um, you can, because that one is PCR based. It can do LAMP, but it, it is primarily PCR based. The, the other devices that incorporate isothermal amplification are much cheaper. So um, some of the devices I, sh I showed there, the, the one from the University of Pennsylvania only costs $5 to make. Um, so yeah, you can get much cheaper devices utilizing isothermal amplification. Uh, let's see. Jerome uh, talks about the Minion, a lot of support equipment not shown. Um, yeah, so PCR reagents require refrigeration. Yeah, so we actually did a demo yesterday with the Minion, and we went from um, sample collection all the way through data analysis. And we're able to do this in uh, about an hour, hour and a half. Um, the reagents do require, some reagents do require the refrigeration. So that, that is something that's limiting at this point. Um, there are some things that are required for sample prep like uh, vortexes and, and mini centrifuges as well. So um, you do need some equipment and typically people are, are using when, when this is in a far forward environment, such as West Africa, or um, even on the International Space Station, they have like a little lab set up where you have some of these other devices and you have refrigeration. So um, there, there is some improvements, obviously, that, that can be made. All right, let's see. So e ECBC, uh, Donald ECBC, um, as uh, is currently working with and has worked with DHS um, with a variety of programs. Um, I can't speak exactly to your particular question about the countering WMD office, but um, I could certainly get you in touch with people here that have worked with DHS. All right, Stephanie likes to hear more about the challenges of field sample collection and preparation. Um, best available current methods for preservation. Yeah, so that's one area that we, we do a lot of work here at ECBC to be able to take your sample from the field and preserve it all the way back um, if you want to send it all the way back to the United States. So for further analysis and to be able to re, you know, grow that organism to, to learn more about it. So we have done a lot there. I didn't work on those projects, um, so I don't want to talk about specifics, but I can certainly get some more information for you. Um, I'm not familiar with the Canon Biomedicals Next Gen PCR, uh, Nate. Um, I'd love to hear more. I can stop by your office. <laughs> All right. Let's see what else. Biomeme, commercial version, they reduced the price to 4,000 apparently. Thanks, Max. Um, and then PCR using the universal race primer. I'm, I'm not too familiar with race, so I can't speak to that. I see a bunch of other people typing. Um, let me just see if I missed anybody's question. RACE stands for Rapid Amplification of cDNA Ends. Um, yeah, if you can provide more information on that, Lester. Um, like I said, I, I'm not that familiar with RACE. So yeah, when, when you're dealing with um, a sample in an environment uh, far forward that sometimes you potentially don't know what it is, um, you have to, the soldier, has to wear um, their protective gear. So their mop gear is what it's called. Um, there's certain levels of mop um, based on the potential threat. So yeah, they are, they are fully, um, you have Tyvek suit, you have rubber gloves, you have goggles, um, 
You can even have pappers. Um, yeah, there are a variety of ways to, to protect you from the, the hot sample. And then those samples can be transported to a glove box. Um, they even have uh, mobile labs, such as the, the one from the 20th Saberni Care Lab um, that was part of our demo yesterday. There are also mobile labs based here in the United States um, from the CSTs. So each state has their own CST unit, um, and many of which have, have mobile labs that can do this type of uh, detection analysis. So from Glenn, are, are UAVs intended to collect and retrieve samples or to analyze on site? Um, so currently, most systems do collect and retrieve them, bring them back to a location that's in a more stable lab environment for analysis. There are things in development um, currently that would like to analyze that um, sample um, without having to, to bring it back to a lab. So that, that's, that's a very hot topic right now. Um, let's see, are there any types of passive detection coming online or only point and sample detection? So um, passive detection, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, Sean. So a detection device uh, alerts the responder of possible presence, yes. So, that's what I was mentioning in the beginning, um, the difference between detection and identification. So there are a bunch of different technologies, including LIDAR particle counters that, that can alert you that a, um, the, of the possible presence of a biological agent, but not specifically identify. I don't have as much experience with those type of technologies, so I won't comment in, in much more detail. But um, there, there are obviously developments going on with them. So Jerome asked, what's the best way to introduce new biodetection technologies to DITRA? Um, I'm not a program manager, but I can, I can definitely tell you of ways um, to do this. So uh, DITRA has a, a CBD, uh, SNT uh, conference every other year. That's a good place to go and interact with program managers, learn about what DITRA is interested in. Um, you, can, you can submit to their uh, broad agency announcement proposals um, that you can find online. Um, that's a, that's a, a way. Uh, I, I would recommend those two methods. All right, from Sarah. How are you dealing with choosing the proper library for analyzing a sample with the MINI? So, if it's an unknown sample. So there are a variety of different um, library preparation methods you can use with the MINI that are, that are commercially available. Um, I'm interested in ones that are, are more rapid um, require less reagents, less equipment. Um, so I've been using the Rapid Amplification Kit, which only um, actually ra Rapid Preparation Kit, which only takes about eight minutes. Um, some kits require, you know, three hours of, of library prep time. Um, she's asking if you if you have an unknown sample and you pick the incorrect library, you could get a negative result. Um, yeah, that, that could be true, um, but if you have, if you have DNA, um, the biggest thing is your concentration. So if you think you have a small amount of DNA, you can use a kit that incorporates PCR into the library preparation. Um, and, and the requirements for, for that amount of DNA are much lower than, say, the rapid kit. So, if you're unsure um, of your sample, if you think it might be in low concentrations, I would suggest using, using one of those that amplifies the DNA um, before performing the library. Corey, thank you. Uh, if anyone watching, if you have further questions, uh, please do get in touch with us later. 
and Corey will actually potentially be able to help us in answering some of those questions. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to mention a few of HCIX services. Uh, the one I just referred to, we call it technical inquiry. Uh, you can go online to do this we, and submit a question. We provide up to four hours of free research services in answering it, uh, provided it falls within our focus areas. Uh, and RTIs have a fairly rapid turnaround time. And so, as with the webinar today with Corey, we often turn to our SME network in assessing technologies and science and in answering these TIs. Now, many of the questions today were, were broad and forward-looking, and they may pertain beyond the scope of our TIs, but uh, can be utilized through our core analysis task, or CAT. Uh, this is how we support research and development within the defense and federal communities. It is a pre-competed and pre-awarded, and thus we can begin work on a CAT in as little as six weeks after a statement of work is signed and approved. So thank you again for attending, and please check out hdiac.org for more information. And here at the end of the screen, we'll have our contact information up. And thank you again for watching.